All right, welcome everyone. My name is E.R. Anderson. I'm the executive director of Keras Circle. Mm -hmm. Keras Circle is the nonprofit programming arm of Keras Books. And Keras Books is, of course, the South's oldest independent feminist bookstore. And this weekend, uh, in addition to a few other things going on in the world, um, happens to be Keras's 46th birthday. And when we thought about what we wanted to do to celebrate our birthday in uncertain times, we knew that we wanted to be around friends. Um, and so we were really excited to invite Charlene Ball and Libby Ware to celebrate with us um, in, in honor of their co-written book, uh, As Lily Charles, um, The Murder at the Estate Sale, a Molly and Emma bookseller adventure. And, you know, when we were thinking about, like, how do you plan for the weekend after <laughs> and uh, how do you how do you think about this? I was like, what I want is a cozy mystery <laughs> kind of night with old <laughs> friends uh, who know Karis well. Um, I read this book and loved it uh, when it was in its draft form, <laughs> and um, you know, I wanted to just talk about the pleasure of books and the pleasure of you know characters who are familiar. Uh, who feel like old friends. Um, there's, of course, it is a murder mystery, so it's not all, it's not, it's not so cozy. Um, and, you know, we've, we've still got some good, uh, some good hijinks in here. Um, but we're really, we're really thrilled to, to get to celebrate this book and to celebrate it this weekend in particular. So I know we have a lot of old Karis friends watching. Um, some, some folks have already said hi and happy birthday in the chat. So thank you. Um, if you are uh, new to Karis or new to Libby and Charlene, I know you're going to really uh, enjoy tonight and getting to know more. Um, you can, if you do not yet have your copy of Murder at the Estate Sale, you can click on that green button at the bottom of your screen. And that will allow you to buy it immediately. And tomorrow from 12 to 2 p.m., mm -hmm. Lily Charles in, in, their <laughs> form, in their shared form will be at Karis <laughs> Design Murder at the Estate Sale um, at our socially distant, smashed up uh, porch pop-up birthday party. So... Um, come through if you would like to get a signed copy and um, they will be happy to sign it for you. So the last thing I'm going to tell you is at any point you can um, click the ask a question button at the bottom of the screen okay. and towards the end of the event, I'll be popping back up to uh, read your questions aloud. Um, so think of some good questions. I think, you know, anything from antiquarian book selling to dog ownership to anything <laughs> really fair, fair game for this crowd. So um, we're, we're thrilled to have you here. And uh, this is a great way to kick off our birthday. So thank you both. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Charlene Ball, and I'm half of the Lily Charles writing team. And I just want to say before I turn it over to the other half, <laughs> thanks so much to Karis for inviting us to be yes. part of their their birthday weekend. So I'm one half of Lily Charles and I'm Libby Ware and I am the other half. And yes, thank you so much, ER and Karis and we love y'all and so thrilled. Yeah. I was just so thrilled yeah. when, you know, when y'all said, you know, we want you to be part of our birthday celebration. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, we, we've, uh, we've had all three events before each of us won. And mm -hmm. at the time I said, boy, this was a dream of a lifetime. And it still mm -hmm. is, it's still thrilling. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to talk a little bit about how we came to write this book. And Charlene and I are both antiquarian booksellers and we enjoy going to uh, book events, especially book fairs. You know, you go to estate sales, you run into the same people, you go to library sales. As a matter of fact, we were at a library sale one time and we were all standing around talking and one of the book dealers looked at his watch and he said, well, five more minutes that we can be friends. <laughs> Because after that, we're all going to, you know, run hell bent for leather, you know, looking for the best books. But anyway, so it's an interesting world of, of antiquarian booksellers and a lot of interesting characters. So, you know, for years we go, oh, yeah, we should do this. And then finally, we're like, oh, you know, we should have a have a murder mystery. And that would be really great because then we could write, you know, more than one book with the same characters. And so we decided that we would have a series and that each book would be in a different location and it would focus on a different set of books. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's a genre 
for this kind of book and it's called a biblio mystery and that's any kind of mystery that has a you know something about mm -hmm. books or book selling well mostly about books um as one facet of it and there can be a murder or not be a murder um some of them are just about books like some of you may be familiar with shadow of the wind that was a really popular book and that would fall into that category and john dunning has a whole series of biblio mysteries the first one is called book to die and he's mm -hmm. got um you know gosh, I don't know, over 10 in the series now. And another really famous one, which is different uh, because it's medieval, is The Name of the Rose that came out, you know, some 30 years ago or so. Um, but that's a type of a biblio mystery also. So one other thing that we like to do is um, when I told a friend of mine who's a bookseller that I was writing a biblio mystery and she got all excited and she said, oh, I love biblio mysteries because I always learn something. So you'll, you know, learn about antiquarian books, whether you want to or not. <laughs> and one of the things that we do is at each chapter heading, we will have a description of a book. So for the first book, the type of books that we're focusing on are occult books and that is part of the plot and then also each chapter heading is going to have a description of a book mm -hmm. and we got this idea from a writer who sadly died this past year um, her name is leah Waite, and she writes in antique print mysteries and so hers are about an antique print dealer and so at the beginning of each chapter she would have a description of a print you know like a windsor home or something like that and uh, so I wrote to her and I said, would it be okay if we, you know, kind of stole your idea? And she was very gracious and said, oh, yes, of course. And um, anyway, so that's where we got the idea from it. And I hope that if you read it, you'll enjoy it and also learn something. So I'm going to start by reading a few pages from Murder, the Estate Sale. And then Libby will read a little. So, chapter one. Molly wasn't a morning person, not by a long shot, but for a book sale, she could jump out of bed before the dew dried. The announcement had read, estate sale of non-Agerian, tons of books including children's, cookbooks, leather, and a signed first edition of Gone with the Wind. Molly knew that antique dealers as well as book dealers would be lining up for Gone with the Wind. Not her, though. She'd be checking out the rest of the tonnage, and she'd had good luck in the Sherwood Forest area of Atlanta. As soon as she turned onto Friar Tuck Way, she saw a line of vans pull up along the street. Please let me be in the first 25, she wished. The women who ran these estate sales only let 25 people in at a time. Since Scott's antique market was this weekend, more dealers than usual were in town. Hurrying down the driveway in front of the yellow brick ranch house, she saw a knot of dealers. The usual suspect, she thought, walking up behind Harry and Jay, two dealers she'd known for years. Hi, guys. Molly, Jay exclaimed, bouncing from one foot to the other. He beamed, his reddish hair standing on end. Never still, he reminded Molly of a squirrel on the road. <laughs> Harry stooped to put an arm around Molly in a lazy embrace. She had to stretch up to hug his bulky shoulders. He wore a thin black faded t-shirt and his graying ponytail was pulled back with an elastic band with a turquoise and silver ornament. Harry and Jay owned the store together, Blind Tiger Books. Jay was exclaiming over his latest sale. I paid a hundred bucks, bucks for an Andy Warhol, Warhol broadside bidding at 4, 4 a.m. on eBay and sold it recently for 2,500. Molly counted the people in front of her. Who's ahead of me? Me, said a dealer standing by Jay, and I'm after him, he pointed to Harry. Good, she thought. I'm 11th in line, not too far behind Harry and Jay. A short, dark-haired woman came down the walk, pulling a rolling cart behind her. Molly remembered seeing her at the St. Pete Book Fair. Then she groaned. Buck Hubble, wearing a wide-shouldered tan travel jacket and carrying several tote bags, 
trotted behind the woman, trying to overtake her so he'd be ahead in line. As the woman came up behind her, Molly said, Hi, I'm Molly. I think we met in St. Pete, but I don't remember your name. She put out her hand and the woman shook it. Her hand was cold as a creamsicle. Emma Clark. She dropped Molly's hand and quickly stepped sideways closer to Molly, pulling her rolling card in front of her and thus cutting off Buck, who had tried to push between them. He scowled and stood close behind Emma, clutching his empty tote bags. Humph, he said to no one in particular, sniffing. I smell dog. Molly ignored him. He didn't have much room to talk, considering that he reeked of garlic and onions, as if his sweat glands were working overtime. She turned her attention back to Emma. Female sellers were rare, so she was happy to meet her. St. Pete, your first book fair? Yes, I've been collecting for years, and after looking around my house and deciding that they were taking over, I decided it was time to make room for more books. Molly laughed. I think a lot of us start out as collectors. Buck wandered to the house to look in the windows. Molly said in an, over, in an undertone, watch out for that guy. He's a known book thief. A book thief? Molly nodded. Buck Hubble. I call him Bucky Burglar. He's a pain at library sales. He'll dig under tables when it's not allowed. And I've seen him go behind bookstore counters. In fact, he's been banned from some of Atlanta's finest bookstores. Why don't they ban him from estate sales? People that run estate sales don't necessarily know about what goes on in the world of book selling. It's a totally different world. More people were arriving. Retired couples who sold antiques as a hobby. Book scouts who would sell their finds to bookstores. Owners of antique stores dealers who travel to antique fairs, and curious neighbors of the 90-year-old book collector. Two elderly women arrived in a vintage Cadillac. Joyce, in an ivory pantsuit, helped Maisie out of the car and got her walker from the back. Maisie, gleaming white hair in a pixie cut and wearing a brocade pink jacket and long pink crepe skirt, proceeded slowly toward the house. The dealers in line drew back to let the women pass. Need help? Asked a man in a tweed jacket who stood by the door. Michael was an engineer who frequented the sales. No, I'm fine, drawled Maisie. Seems like I've been like this forever, but I keep on going. But she accepted his elbow, let him take the walker, and leaned on him to go up the three steps. She disappeared into the house behind her walker. That's Joyce and Maisie who run these estate sales, murmured Molly to Emma. I'm new to estate sales. How do they work? Well, you have to stand in line in the order you arrived. Everyone here knows that and will tell you to move back if you try to get in ahead of them. When the door opens precisely at 10 o'clock, they let in 25 people at a time and then shut the door. Do they ever let anyone in early? Never. Not even in snow and sleet. Once you get in, make a mad dash to where the books are. They may be all over the house or in the library, the basement, or upstairs. If you see something you think you want, don't hesitate. Grab first, examine later. That's why it's good to bring lots of tote bags. Emma nodded. What kind of books are you interested in? Occult, cookbooks, books about books, illustrated. Occult? That's astrology, witchcraft, stuff like that? Emma raised an eyebrow. Right. Also spiritualism. I've got some Blavatsky, Annie Besant, and a be beautiful illustrated volume on Rosicrucians by Arthur Waite. I even named one of my dogs Blavatsky. Emma frowned. Molly wondered if it was because of Molly's interest in a cult or in reaction to the mention of a dog. What do you sell? Children's. A few illustrated classics, so I overlap with you a bit. The door opened and dealers began to file in. Molly and Emma among them. Maisie mm -hmm. sat at a small table inside, counting them as they passed. Books, Molly asked. Thirteen to the left and everywhere. Fourteen, fifteen. Buck pushed back past them both. Molly noticed that Emma stayed close behind her as she ran into the large library on the left. I hope she doesn't stick to me like a burr, Molly thought. Making new friends was all very well, but once inside, it was everyone for herself. 
Other dealers were already pulling books off the ceiling high shelves and stuffing them into their tote bags. Some had brought rolling carts like Emma. Others created piles on the floor. Molly planted herself in front of a shelf and began filing her bag, filling her bags. Later, she would check to see if they were first editions or signed. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw Emma kneeling at a low shelf and stuffing books into a large bag in her rolling cart, dark, gray-streaked hair screening her face. She's cute, thought Molly. Then she scolded herself. She's probably straight with those shoes. Emma wore thin-soled ballet-type flats. Molly glanced down at her own all-terrain sandals with satisfaction. She saw a mockingbird and drew her breath in. It was a first edition book club, had a picture of the author on the back, photo by Truman Capote. She stuffed it into her bag. Quickly, she scanned titles before anyone else invaded her section of the built-in shelves. She decided to look for cookbooks. Most of these older homes had a copy of Mrs. Dole's Southern Cooking, a book she could always sell. She stepped into the hallway looking for more bookshelves when she noticed a door slightly ajar with a sign reading, Do Not Enter. She felt a moment's impulse to open it a little more and take a peek. But Jay trotted down the hall, his backpack bulging. So she turned away from the door. She stared in the direction of the kitchen, intent on cookbooks, where she heard a muffled scream. Molly jerked her head up as Emma Clark burst through the door and collided with her. Molly gently disentangled herself from Emma, who seemed to stroll. What's the matter? You look like you've seen a ghost. Emma shook her head. No, not a ghost. The real thing. Maybe someone's dead. Come look. Someone's dead. Come on. The door led, as Molly had suspected, down to the basement. The steps were steep and not quite wide enough for the length of a foot. A bare bull with the foot of the stairs gave a dim light. She followed Emma carefully, placing her sandals sideways and feeling with her hand on the rough framing and drywall as there was no rail. Molly reached the bottom of the stairs, took in a breath, and widened her eyes. She saw in front of her a floor-to-ceiling wall of shelves full of books. Wow, she said under her breath. Look, Emma urged, tugging at her sleeve. Molly glanced down and gasped. A man lay grumpled on the floor, a few feet away from the stairs, right in front of the shelves. On his back, he lay very still. His tan travel jacket was open, revealing many inside pockets all filled with books. Books were spilling out of bags and more were scattered about. A dark pool was spreading from under his head. Some of the books had been spattered. Oh my God, whispered Molly. It's Buck Hubble. All right. Well, that's the beginning of Murder at the Estate Sale. And we have just discovered the body. Molly and Emma are two characters whom you can tell are going to be uh, investigating what happens. So I'm, go I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how we, how we write, because people often ask us, what's our process? Some writers will uh, alternate chapters, like, for example, Marge Piercy and her husband write to have written a book together and she wrote the woman's point of view in one chapter and he wrote the man's point of view in another. Well, our process is very different. We started out by one of us writing a chapter and then emailing it to the other. And then the other one would read that material, edit it, add some more to it, write the next chapter, email it back. So we continued in that way for a while, not really knowing where we were going, because we we're more character oriented than we are plot oriented. So um, some writers like to plot out the entire book and know everything that's going to happen before they write. Neither of us does that. We like to be led along by the story and know event kind of where we're going, but not. Anyway, one of us got the other one's point of view character uh, <laughs> locked in a room with a dead body and no way to get out. So we decided we were going to have to plot things out a little bit. We were going to have to plan at least what was going to happen in the next few chapters. So we started meeting at coffee shops. This was before the pandemic. 
and we had two or three coffee shops near where we both live. We don't live together, but we live close to one another. So we'd go to the coffee shops and we'd sit there and we'd plot out what was going to happen. And then we'd go, we'd decide who was going to write the next chapter and they'd go back and we'd do it. And that worked pretty well. And we finished the book that way. We then read the whole thing over and edited it. We, we had a beta reader that was, that means someone who reads your book for you and makes comments about, on the editing and the story. And we had a writer's group, uh, which is not meeting at the moment, but may meet soon again. Uh, that time we were, we were meeting and they, they gave us a lot of feedback. So that's our process, how we write. Uh, Libby, you're going to tell us some more about, about the books, our series, I believe. Yeah, so one of the things is that one of us is Molly and one of us is Emma, but um, some of you who know us may be able to figure it out. Otherwise, um, just enjoy, you know, and, and so that, and I think more in the first book than the second book that the person who's you know, point of view, you are, you know, you would write in, in their voice and then the next person would do it. But it seems like with the second book that kind of got changed around a lot. Um, you know, just as far as like who knew more, what was coming next is kind of how that worked. So we wrote a second book. It's uh, in the editing process now and it's going to be called, what is it going to be called? <laughs> Murder at the Book Fair, and it is going to take place in St. Pete, Florida, and the emphasis is going to be on children's books and illustrated classics, and so we'll have, at the head of each chapter, we'll be have a description, like in a bookseller's catalog, a description of a favorite children's book or illustrated classics, like Treasure Island or something. The current book, Murder at the Estate Sale, as Libby told you, has the um, headings with uh, occult books. So there's, mm -hmm. there's one about spiritualism and there's one about, uh, you know, several on theosophy and, mm -hmm. and so forth. So, uh, I think now at this point, we'd like to throw open the, the, uh, space for Q and A. So would anyone like to ask us any questions? We'll see if we can answer them. Hi, uh, well, I'm going to get us started. So uh, I had the fortune of reading this book um, early before it was mm -hmm. totally finished. So um, what, uh, how did y'all decide to incorporate, you know, I know that some of the hobbies like dog ownership mm -hmm. are maybe things that are actually from real life. Um, but how did you decide which parts of the book to kind of weave in from your real life? Um, and, and how did you, you know, decide what really truly was fiction? Mm. <laughs> yeah. And, and I'm glad you, you brought, we brought up the dogs because Molly has two wolf Irish, I mean, I'm sorry, Russian wolfhounds and their names are Blavatsky and Dimitri and Blavatsky is a famous, uh, theosophy person, uh, usually called Madame Blavatsky. Um, and so it's a different kind of dog than I have, but at the time I had two dogs. Sadly, both of them have passed away now, but uh, they were kind of like Blavatsky uh, and Dimitri, where they, you know, barked a lot and were known to break out windows. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was an unfortunate accident. Yeah. But anyway, so I think that was part of it is, um, you know, and, talking about our houses, you know, if you see the description of our houses, you know, it's pretty much what our houses really look like. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I guess the main way that we, um, we differed is for one thing, um, Molly is a little bit more adventurous than Emma, but, but they're both more adventurous than either one of us are, <laughs> you know, there's a part where they like break into this place to go into a, you know, down mm -hmm. these, into this spooky basement and, um, <laughs> and, uh, sorry, I'm going to move over. Okay. Um, yeah, so no, this way. Um, yeah, so, you know, it pretty much, I mean, it's kind of like some of the characteristic of us are real, but you know, all the rest of it is just all made up. 
you know, and, and the, and the characters are, um, you know, are all made up. And, um, I think we have some, some good characters who are not based on, on real people that, um, you know, and that's what's one of the things that's kind of fun is to kind of create a character and they kind of take on their own, you know, they take on their own personality and sometimes you can't get them to shut up. <laughs> they try to tell you what to do. I will say I did wonder because, you know, since I am a bookseller, uh, there is a notorious thief that we've that we've all uh, had to deal with from time mm -hmm. to time. And I, I laughed out loud because I, I uh -huh. <laughs> Perhaps this thief was the arch archetypical <laughs> thief that we all know in Georgia. Yes, inspired by. <laughs> it's great. Um, every, every, everything is fictional. Yes, all. of course. It's not, it's fictional. Right, yes. That's but, our and we're sticking to it, right. right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, uh, it just reminded me that one of the great ways to get revenge in, in life is to write a book. <laughs> right, yeah, it's right. Kill off somebody. <laughs> So Andy Meek asks, what is your most interesting estate sale book find? Mm. Hello, my fellow bookseller, Andy. <laughs> He's a member of GABA, the Georgia Antiquarian Booksellers Association. <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, oh, that's a tough one. Um, gosh, I got to think of something. Um, the one who didn't die. What's that? That pornographic one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there was a really good uh, pornographic book, and and Charlene <laughs> said, "Oh no, that's pornographic." And then we didn't get it, and then we went to the car and we looked it up, and uh, it turned out that it goes for like eight hundred dollars or something. Mm -hmm. And I mean, yeah. they wanted something like a hundred and twenty-five, and it's like I just didn't know, and I didn't even look at it because she said it was pornographic, mm -hmm. but. Uh, <laughs> So I guess, so Andy, I guess that's the one that got away that we didn't find. <laughs> that's great. Well, so, you know, it pays big money. Um, yep. So Akazia wants to know, how do you negotiate storylines and editing? Hmm. Well, let me see. Uh, negotiate? You mean like if she wants to take something out and I don't, how would we decide about that. Uh, hello, Acacia, anyway, glad you're here. <laughs> uh, we don't have conflicts over that. Usually if I want to take something out, she does, she agrees and vice versa. It's usually um, something like something that's too much because the way we write is Libby writes in a more spare style. I write in a more flowing and fulsome style and I often need to trim back. But I'm, I'm very aware of that. I don't mind trimming back at all. I, I know that I have to. And Libby can sometimes uh, write o overwrite and want to trim herself back. So mm -hmm. uh, we don't have conflicts. We don't have to negotiate it, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because sometimes I'll, because I think, you know, I'm, I think I'm pretty good at tightening. And so sometimes I'll go through and I'll say, yeah, I tighten up this chapter that you wrote. And she's like, oh, I hope you didn't take out too much of my beautiful writing. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't know. She says it more modestly than that, but that's kind of the idea because, um, like she says, she she's more of a flowery, you know, kind of a, a writer. Well, I don't like to call it hard. flowery. Really. No. I'd rather say I like description. In fact, I was told by by uh, an editor that I was that I was talking to that description was one of my strengths. Mm -hmm. So it I is. like to mm -hmm. do that, yeah. and I think we both we both do pretty well with dialogue. So. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, so let's leave mm -hmm. it at that. <laughs> yeah, but I think that some of the more lush writing, like when she describes libraries and books and things like that, where it's kind of waxing poetic, that's that's Charlene's writing, and I'll give her the credit for that. So can you talk a little bit about the, I know that you at Toad Libby occasionally carry and collect occult books, um, not pornographic ones, but... Um, <laughs> And, and I wonder a little bit, and so this, the, you know, the, the sort of the book theme of this book is about occult books. So how do you discern what is um, an interesting occult book that has value um, from a, a occult book that is just like a weird oddity? Um, like, how do you, how do you determine that? Because I can imagine like things could be interesting, but, you know, just sort of 
for for novelty's sake as opposed to like truly having um a historical significance right okay and most of the occult books that i like are either late 19th century or early 20th century say maybe between like 1880 and 1921 and so i know a lot of the authors that wrote at that time a lot of the theosophist and spiritualist and you know then i've got um you know like say the golden dawn and um alistair crowley of course who came out of the golden dawn before he kind of went over to the dark side and so i've got several of his books and so i think the main thing not always but usually knowing who the author is or knowing if if they are um a proponent of you know a particular branch you know either astrology or spiritualism or um you know, any of the other, you know, tarot or anything like that. And it's just kind of a knowledge of knowing who's who. But then there's also books that I find that isn't necessarily somebody that I know of, but I'm interested in the subject. Um, I like a lot of the spiritualism books. And a lot of times that's just like, there's one that was, uh, it's called, um, was Abraham Lincoln a spiritualist? And it's written by a medium. (laughs) And this person, it was a, it was a small, you know, red book, like about that big. And um, this person contended that uh, that Abraham Lincoln was involved in seances at the White House. And in reality, his wife was because their son had died while they were in the White House. And Mary Todd Lincoln was very much into seances and trying to contact her son. But I had never read in anything that Abraham Lincoln was interested in it or not. So that was what. The, so that's kind of like what you're talking about, like kind of the quirky book. And I did get it because it was quirky and did eventually sell it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, Lisa Cottrell wants to know. She says, "Thanks for the queer romance aspect of the murder mystery. Who had that idea?" I think we both did. Hi, really. Lisa. <laughs> Hi, Lisa. <laughs> Glad you're here. We both, I think it it evolved. I think we just sort of knew that we had these two characters and before too long, we had the idea that they were going to get together. But many mystery books do have that developing romance quality. And sometimes it takes two or three books before they actually get together. Mm -hmm. And so ours aren't quite like that. Like some of them have the, in the first book, the two characters hate each other. In the second book, they start to like each other. In the third (laughs) book, they fall madly in love. Well, it's not quite like that. They start to really be attracted in the middle of this book. But they're very cautious. They're very cautious. Yeah, yeah. they're very cautious Mm -hmm. because of, you know, both being in relationships before. So they're... Mm -hmm. And they love living alone. I know, ER, you relate mm-hmm. to that, mm-hmm. <laughs> you and Sarah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, you know, they don't want to uh, change their world very much. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. So they're proceeding cautiously. Mm-hmm. That's all we'll say. <laughs> I saw, um, I saw a, a reader, not from our community, just an online reader who happened to have read the book, um, say that she really appreciated and and found it novel to read a romance about lesbians who were not young um oh. and and i thought about that and i i realized that that was true that you know particularly my sense of this reviewer was that she was a young woman mm-hmm. um, and so i think you know the idea that like this this romance is you know a, a romance between full full grown adults right like <laughs> yeah it, this isn't some teenage romance, um, but it still has the the giddiness and the fun and all of that of new love. I think people um, don't realize how rare that is until you see it um, in a book. And so I wonder if you thought about that at all, or if you were just like, well, this is our, our reality. So of course we're going to write about this. I think it was, it's that it is our reality. And so we wrote about it and then realized that, Probably there aren't that many books like that. We're we're kind of deliberately not specific of their exact ages because if we made them the age that we are now, I think stereotypes would intrude and people would be put off because they'd be expecting the stereotypes mm-hmm. and that they, they wouldn't be getting them. But so we're we're saying, you know, we're a little vague about them, but they are mature and they yeah. have had 
they have had uh, lives before this story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. Ralph wanted to know, do you ever work out dialogue by talking to each other? <laughs> That's an idea. Hi, Ralph. No, Ralph. Um, yeah, Ralph's in our writing group. Oh, Ralph. No, we yeah. don't. Hey, Ralph. <laughs> <laughs> no, we've never done that. We just each uh, write on our own and, you know, write dialogue for each other. So th that would be interesting, though. I know that like when we've been on car trips that we've talked about the plot. And <laughs> one of the times that we um, worked a lot on it is we went up to a place called Parker Ranch. I don't know if you all know about that, but it's a it's a lesbian B&B &B, and there's a lot of lesbians who are now built going up there and building their own cabin. It was a, it was a summer home for the famous Inman family from Atlanta. It's up in Clayton, Georgia. And so um, Charlene and I went up there and we, um, we took our dogs and our dogs. Yeah, my dogs. <laughs> <laughs> and in the morning we would go for a walk with the dogs and they had this big field where the dogs could run free. And so we'd walk around <laughs> and we would plot out the next part because Charlene would get up early and write. And then, you know, I would later on, I would get that and I would edit, but then we would talk about what the next thing that was going to happen was. So, you know, in addition to the coffee houses and also, you know, long car rides when, you know, we can kind of, you know, bat around the uh, plot, which is really great because Charlene and I have each written our own book and we, you know, we met through our writers group and, so we knew each other's writing and so we would you know bat around ideas you know like i'd be talking about my book and she'd give me ideas and vice versa and so it was great doing that but of course it's even better if you're not the only one writing it <laughs> you're writing it together because you know one idea you know builds upon another yeah um because asks, how has the antiquarian booksellers community responded to the novel? I haven't really heard from anyone who's read it yet. I'm, I'm hoping that I'm glad to hear Andy and maybe some other people are on here that I'm not hearing. But um, yeah, I really want booksellers to, to buy the book and, and read it. So I need to do more publicity that that way. Well, I'm not an antiquarian bookseller, but as a fellow bookseller, uh, that it, it rings true in terms of the love of books and the excitement and, you mm -hmm. know, the, um, the thrill of finding, you know, a, a new find and feeling, yeah. like, mm -hmm. you know, you, um, you, you can just kind of go down a rabbit hole, you know, and just mm -hmm. keep going. And keep going. Right. Um, yeah. There's something really joyful about that. And I think you really capture that in this book. Yeah. And I think, you know, the, the funny parts of um, capturing the sort of various personalities of the, you know, all the weird people who get involved in uh, book selling, you know, and all of their backstories, it's that that comes through as well. So, oh, OK, good. Um, so Eleanor Smith says, I was really intrigued by the descriptions of the occult books at the heads of the chapters. How much do you believe in the occult? What, if anything, draws you and what do you blow off? Hi, Eleanor. Yes, hi, Eleanor. <laughs> <laughs> you all start. Oh, gosh. Um, yeah, I, be I believe in, in some of it. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in reading books about life after death. And I think that's the spiritualism part that you know really kind of appeals to me because I don't know if I believe in it or not but I think it's a nice thing to believe in um, and so I like to see things that are convincing and not um, you know some charlatan <laughs> there's actually a couple books that have been written um, that are kind of like exposing the secrets because you know when there was an explosion in the late 19th century of spiritualism and you know some of the people really were hoaxes but I'm not sure all were Mm -hmm. So I'm leaving my mind open about that. I do believe in astrology. I, I know what it means to live through a uh, Mercury retrograde, which is what we're in the middle of right now. <laughs> and I've had examples in my own life to attest to Mercury going retrograde. So uh -huh. those of you who know what that means, you know what I'm talking about. Um, 
and then some of it is um you know just kind of intellectual in a way a lot of the theosophists is um you know kind of you know complex theories of life on earth and being and consciousness and so yeah i believe in a good bit of it may i put in a word yeah, you i'm not a, a i'm not a collector of occult books although i do have an interest in witchcraft and alchemy a little bit but um i'm more rationalist than she is we don't argue about it but i really don't believe in astrology even though I like it as a symbolism, as a pattern of symbolism that you can use uh, to try to talk about, a framework to talk about things in. It's, it's a neat way to talk about people without getting too personal, you know, hmm. uh, talking about people's weaknesses and strengths without them taking offense. <laughs> <laughs> right. And the other thing is... <clears throat> I am not as sanguine as she is about it because I'm a little bit afraid of the other world. And if it exists, I don't want to give it much encouragement. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> if it doesn't exist, that's fine. But I think mm -hmm. that any part of it exists, I want to show great respect for it and not encourage it to hang around. <laughs> that was going to be my follow-up a little bit because I, I just saw um, Jennifer McMahon, who's a great uh, feminist mystery writer and sort of, like borderline um like sort of dark mystery and sometimes she has supernatural mm. elements in her mysteries uh she was talking about how she um the only subject some so she was doing like a q a with her fans and she somebody said well is there any subject that you won't write about and she said i won't write about demonic possession because uh, yeah i i just I'm genuinely afraid of that and I just don't want to even crack that door open because mm -hmm. you just never know. Right. Like, mm -hmm. uh, which I thought was really interesting because she's written about all these other things with seeming like lots of ghosts. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. What's her uh, name? Hey, I might like to look her books. So. Jennifer McMahon, M E M C I'm reading off my shelf here. M A H O N. Um, She's a great writer and, and truly a feminist. Um, and she's a lesbian mystery writer. Okay. Um, I love her, but I, I thought about that too, about, um, you know, are there any kinds of occult books that you would just not, not care to write about? It sounds like Charlene's pretty clear about what she does. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. Like I like to write about the supernatural as a, as a plot device. I like to incorporate little touches, but I don't, you know, as far as having it in my life, you know. Yeah, and that is one of the things that we had to decide in this book. And um, I don't want to give away too much of, of the book, but we did want to decide, did we want to go down that road of having something kind of supernatural happen? Mm -hmm. And I think we have something that is kind of like... Um, don't give if, if you believe something like if you believe you know and this is not what happened but let's say you believe that someone can curse you mm -hmm. and then you know you might fall over you know and then you know hurt yourself and then you're going to say you know oh well that was you know because i was cursed so um that's completely different than the thing that's that's in the end of the book but um Don't yeah we, we had no. yeah but that, <laughs> like i said we just had to decide is it going to be anything that is kind of supernatural mm -hmm. or um you know, mm -hmm. kind of not proven by science, let's say. <laughs> yeah. Well, and Lisa says that um, she's very interested in seeing your next book and seeing how you work yeah. in the, the children's book aspect. And I am too. Okay. Um, uh, do you, do you have children's book favorites that you already kind of maybe know that you're going to be incorporating? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, a key book in that uh, key book that is, uh, important is the um the kai nielsen illustrated um version of old nordic fairy tales now what is the name east of the sun east of the sun west of the moon which is the title of a, a tale and kai nielsen is a wonderful turn of the century artist and he's he was uh, danish he uh, was part of the golden age of illustration which was the early 20th century so that's that's 
that figures importantly in the second book. Also, Jessie Wilcox Smith was a wonderful woman uh, illustrator, also in the golden age of illustration, the early 20th century. And uh, several books by her get mentioned and will be at cha in chapter headings and are among my personal favorites. <laughs> and let's see, what are some other? Then there's um, Dr. Seuss. Um, what's that one? Uh, to think I saw it on Mulberry Street, which is a very expensive book. That's his mm -hmm. first book. Yeah, and that, mm -hmm. that goes for a lot. And so there's about four or five books in particular that are in that book, um, in, you know, in our second book, which has, we've written all of it. it mm -hmm. So it's in the editing stage now. So mm -hmm. um, others I'd like to recommend if people like illustrated classics are um, the... Um, Robert Louis Stevenson's Child Garden, Child's Garden of Verses, illustrated by Jesse Wilcox Smith, and Treasure Island, Kidnapped, uh, uh, Tale of Two Cities, all of them I think have Howard Pyle or NCY in, in 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 yeah. illustrations. Mm -hmm. yeah. There are just some really lovely, interesting, there's, there are a lot of Alice in Wonderland books with really, I mean, Jesse Smith illustrated one Alice, didn't she? Oh, did she? I think so, yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, oh, and uh, oh, at the back of the North Wind, my favorite, one of my favorite books <laughs> from childhood is also illustrated by Smith, as well as The Princess and the Goblin, which is by. Mm -hmm. Do you know that one? Mm -hmm. Princess and the Goblin by. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm forgetting his. I'm forgetting the name now. Uh, anyway, I that, forget who wrote it. McDonald. Yeah. Is it McDonald? Oh, is it George no, McDonald? No, George McDonald is the back of the North Wind. I think he wrote that one too, though. Okay, yeah. Don't get us started talking about books. <laughs> yeah, don't. Uh, well, Lisa <laughs> wants to know, will your next book have any illustrations? No, mm -hmm. we don't have No. That's the thing about books for grown-ups. They usually don't have illustrations. Yeah. And you'd, we'd have to go to an expense to get someone to illustrate it, you know. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's not a bad idea. I think books for grown-ups probably should have illustrations. Mm -hmm. So, so Lisa, when you read it and you read about the books and the illustrations, you'll just have to look them up online and see the pictures there. So you can mm -hmm. fill in the blanks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, so do y'all have the third book theme? Uh, out? Like the, well, the genre? We've got lots of ideas. We had one idea that was that was actually going to be set at a uh, boot, so-called boot camp for booksellers, which it, it used to be called uh, CABS. Well, or, it's called CABS, and it's the Colorado Antiquarian Book School mm -hmm. or Book Selling School. And I went there, and, I mean, it is so intense. I mean, you know, I <laughs> learned exactly how much I do not know <laughs> about book selling. Mm -hmm. um, and they had it in Colorado Springs, and so now – it was supposed to be this year, but of course it didn't happen. Um, they, they're moving to Minnesota. So it's going to be, they're going to call it Minnesota caps. <laughs> but, so I had thought, well, I've been there. And so I can describe the landscape, but I've never been to Minnesota. <laughs> so we may just have to change the location and make it in the North Georgia mountains or something like that. Cause it's a, it's an idea mm -hmm. about uh, that, hap that would happen in the mountains. And then on the other hand, I'm thinking, well, it would be bit, would be good if we brought them back to Atlanta and maybe the next one would be either, you know, like murder at a library or murder at the Decatur Book Festival or, you know, something so we can come back and see the dogs. Yeah. <laughs> I love them. That's important. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so from from start to finish in your writing process, about how long does it take you now to, to make a book? Mm, way too long. Yeah, way too long because there's not yeah. only us, but there's the publisher, you know, get it, getting it read by beta readers and and then send, getting it accepted by a publisher and then that whole process. That's that's yeah. very time consuming. And and I mean, even the even the uh, the writing, you know, we're mm -hmm. not we we're mm -hmm. not very well disciplined writers. Don't we don't. That. <laughs> I, I intend to write every day of my life, but it just doesn't happen. <laughs> So it, it, it take, the first one, it took us a very long time because we would write something and then we were taking it to Woman Rights, the writers conference, and people there would like to hear it. And then we'd say, and, you know, we were each working on our own projects and we're like, 
oh, woman rights is coming up. We have to write another chapter. And so we'd write something and then we wait another six months. So that one took a really long time. And long. the second one went faster, but it still took about two years. Yeah, I, I really don't see how people can uh, publish a book a year, you know, and like to have anyone else look at it at all, you know, because we belong to writers groups. Charlene belongs to two. I belong to, run, to one. And, you know, that's really helpful being in a writer's group. Um, and I know some people, they want to write the whole thing through and they don't want to show it to anybody until they're finished. Mm -hmm. But we kind of read as we're, you know, writing along. And and so that, that draws it out a little bit, doing it that way. Well, so do you have any contemporary uh, books that you are most loving right now of any genre? Just books that are getting you through the pandemic? giving you life right now that you can recommend? Well, there's different series of books. Um, we've both been kind of a binge on that with murder mysteries and, and detective fiction and things like that. And we're reading some books now by Kristen Lepienko. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. um, yeah. you know, I read the review of her fourth book and I thought it said a lesbian, but she kind of goes back and forth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Let's see. The first one is, um, do you remember the name of the first one? I can go get them. Yeah. They all have these things, these names, like, you know, the last, place. Yeah, it, yeah, the last it, place. yeah. The last place I look, uh, the last place you look, are you familiar with her ER? Yeah. Sarah loves her. Yeah. And I just, I just ordered from Kara's the fourth one. Um, so there's that one. And, um, you know, a lot of the books that I've been reading lately that I really enjoy are, books that are set in the 19th century and kind of have that feel to them. Um, I'm sorry, my, my, my memory is not as good as well, it used to a be. a book we both read recently is The Star, the Starless Sea by Erin Morgenstern. And uh, that was very, that was interesting, but um, mm -hmm. not my favorite book. She but, liked it better than I but did. It was, but it was mm -hmm. interesting. She does write yeah. beautifully. And uh, I've been into the mysteries of Karen Slaughter. You know, I've read almost all of them. And uh, she is, she's a very good storyteller. She really does draw you along. A little bit too much violence, but uh, anyway. I, I'll read anything Karen Slaughter writes. She's just, great. Yeah, she's, she's a good writer. Mm -hmm. Got a new one coming out later this year. Yeah, the only thing I've read by her are the standalones. And I've liked those. Got to get into the Will Trent's. I love the Will, Will Trent's, yeah. I yeah, like Charlene tells me they're bloody, but I guess I just have to get past that. He's very good <laughs> as a character. I like him as a character. Yeah. You know, some the idea of somebody who's dyslexic, man, but brilliant, able to maneuver, maneuver their way through the world is fascinating. Mm -hmm. And Cheryl Head, she's good. Mm -hmm. She's got a series of a PA. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember the name of those either. It's what? like as soon as I read them, I forget them. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I wish I'd brought my list of good. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Let's see. Uh, and so, you know, like I really like Diane Satterfield. Mm -hmm. I think she's really good. I'm, I'm looking at my shelf because I'm trying to remember the names of these other people that I like um, mm -hmm. who write kind of that 19th century style of book. You know, she very much does that. And I, and we are reading more uh, in, uh, you know, about, contemporary thought like nonfiction like for example uh oh cast cast by isabel wilkinson a wonderful wonderful book and mm -hmm. uh, uh carol anderson's um and uh white rage white rage <laughs> and and the guy who really stamped kind of, from the beginning stamped from the beginning great book mm -hmm. yeah and so i'm very much into that and we're discussing those at first d also and uh some of them. And also, um, I'm, I really started getting into reading mysteries by African American women writers, because uh, I, I love the the perspective. I love the, the Oh, yeah, Attica Locke. She's Attica really Locke, good. Yes. Yeah, she's really uh, good. Cutting season. And, mm -hmm. and then there was who, who is that other one? That, and Cheryl Head. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and there's well, those are some excellent. Emmy, 
Penny, <laughs> Penny Mickleberry. Penny Mickleberry, Atlanta's own. Yep. She's got several of, uh, she's got yeah, about three yeah, series. Yeah, I like that. That's all. right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, uh, we both like reading about witches too, like um, the, mm -hmm. the Morgan. What's her name? Mm, let's see. She's written, Louisa Morgan. Louisa yeah. Morgan. Yeah. She's written about three books about witches. And mm -hmm. I know there's some new ones that are coming out that I'm going to put on my wish list. Yeah. <laughs> Lisa wants to know if you have any political mur murder mystery recommendations. Political, political, political murder mysteries. Mm. Oh, wow. I can't I think, think of any, Lisa. What about. Uh, oh, she's saying you could write one. I misunderstood the question. Oh, oh okay. We could write one. Okay, that's a problem. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I got to put a plug in for um, if you like 19th century lesbian novels, mm -hmm. Plain Bad Heroines takes place partially at a girls boarding school in the 19th century and then partially on in 2017 uh, with a bunch of lesbians who are making a film about the boarding school. And uh -huh. it's gothic romance. Mm -hmm. very funny it's wonderful it's the best book i read in 2020 so oh. what's, the name? what's the name of it it's called plain bad heroin so i'm going to put a link in oh, okay yeah i've read about that and folks can go watch the um event that we did with the author emily danforth um oh, did? on our youtube uh so oh. check that out because she's lovely and it was a wonderful wonderful event do you have it in stock we do. You can come by the store. Bye tomorrow. We'll be there tomorrow. <laughs> but anyone else who's watching can come by tomorrow. Uh, when you're coming to to get your book signed by Lily Charles, you can okay. also get uh, Plain Bad Heroines because it's okay. it's really I think a y'all would love it, and I think probably anyone who likes y'all's work would love it. So oh, yeah, it sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, so well, it was it was on the indie next list. I saw it. Yeah, it is wonderful. Um, you had a um, a nice comment from uh, Karen. Karen says, Charlene and Libby, I am really enjoying this discussion of your writing process. I was gifted a copy of your mystery by Dr. Linda Bell uh, and I'm enjoying it immensely. Thank you to Karis for providing such a great online forum, watching and listening from South Florida and eagerly, eagerly awaiting your next series. So next in this. Oh, okay. Thank, thank, you. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. And thank you to Linda for passing it on to Karen. Yes. Yeah. So it's always fun to see where people are watching from. Um, yeah. So is there anything that we didn't get to that you want to make sure folks know about the book or books, future books? Well, oh, I was just going to say one of the things that's kind of fun, if you're in Atlanta, that we, um, we talk about places, but we don't give them their correct names. Like, for example, there's a, a, a famous uh, pub that they go to uh, that's called Samuel's. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> where where all, all kinds of people go. And yes, talk, yes. And, and so um, so if you know some in-town eateries, you mm -hmm. know, you might get a kick out of, you know, mm -hmm. how they're disguised. Yeah. <laughs> and there's really no reason for doing that except that we thought it was fun. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, this has been really fun. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, thank ER. You. It was yeah. enjoyable. It was great. Uh, and thank you to all of you who came. Yeah. Thanks mm. for watching with us. So come by tomorrow. Wear your mask. 12 to 2 p.m. at Karis. Mm -hmm. We'll be outside. I set the tent up, so we're going to be on the grass in the tent. Okay. okay. Signing books and, um, and having fun. So I uh, ho hope to see some of you. We'll also be giving... Um, little treat bags from Dolce Vegan as a thank you for coming out. So join us and uh, let's, let's keep the birthday celebration and the, the good vibes for our democracy continuing. Um, right. <laughs> so yeah, um, I'll see y'all tomorrow and I hope to see many of you who are watching at home very soon. Um, but until next time, everybody stay safe and well, and thank you for coming. All right.